today I'm going to teach you standards of proof in different stages of a criminal case. So let's start with, when I talk about standards of proof, I'm talking about the amount of evidence that is needed for a certain situation or for a certain uh, facts to be proven to a court, depending on the stage of the, what type of case it is and the stage of the case. So let's start with the highest burden in our criminal justice system, which is the burden to convict a defendant, an accused of a crime. It is the highest burden because it is imperative that there is a lot of evidence to show that a person committed a crime because the punishment is very severe. It is more severe than any other type of case that there is in our justice system. In this situation, for example, in a criminal case, to convict a defendant, he could be facing imprisonment, the um, loss of his um, liberty and the loss of maybe even his life, depending on the type of case. It could be a uh, capital murder case in which he would be facing capital punishment, which means the death penalty. So therefore, the criminal system has the highest burden of evidence when it comes to proving that a person committed a crime because their life and their liberty is at stake. So the stakes are very high. So the evidence that is needed to proceed with such a thing is very high. The highest uh, of it all is to convict, and let's start with a burden of proof that does not exist, that is not the law, but that a lot of people think that it is the law, but they are mistaken. That one is 100% sure of something, beyond all doubt, there is no such thing as beyond all doubt. There's no such standard of proof in our justice system. And the reason for that is that nobody can be 100% sure of anything. That would be an impossible, an impossible uh, standard for anybody or for anything to be able to reach. We would not be able to function like that. That would make the triers of fact, when I say triers of fact, that means the judge or the jury, the ones that are going to decide what happened, they would have to be witnesses themselves. They would have to have witnessed the crime. And of course they cannot be. So in order to have uh, that type of standard, all the jurors would have to have witnessed the crime or the judge would have to have witnessed the crime, and that's impossible, so therefore the law does not require that a case be proven beyond all doubt in order to convict a defendant of a crime. The law says that the prosecution must prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, not beyond all doubt, but beyond a reasonable doubt. What does that mean? Actually, there's no clear definition in our legal system, in our courts, in the law. There's only guidance because that's up to the jury to decide. As long as they understand that it's not beyond all doubt, that it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt, as long as that, it is up to them. It is up to the judge if it's a bench trial. A bench trial means a trial in which the judge is the one that decides whether a person is guilty or not guilty of a crime, not a jury. And who picks whether a judge or a jury? Well, uh, the defendant and uh, the prosecution have to select whether they want a judge or a jury to uh, decide the facts of the case. It depends on also each jurisdiction. So therefore, if the 
uh, accused is being tried by a jury, the jury is the one that decides whether the prosecution has proven the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Notice that I said that the prosecution is the one that has to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Why did I say that? Why did I say that the prosecution has to prove the case? Because the burden of proof in our criminal justice system, the burden of proof, the obligation, the duty, the one that has to prove is the one that accuses. So in a criminal case, the one that accuses is the prosecution and says, therefore, they accuse, they have to prove. They have to prove that the person committed the offense, that the accused committed the offense. Another way to look at it or what the law says is that the burden of proof lies in the prosecution because there is a constitutional right that all people, all, all accused, are presumed innocent until proven guilty. In other jurisdictions, in other countries, it's the other way around. If you're accused of a crime, the burden is on you to prove that you're innocent. In the United States, that's not the law. In the United States, you are presumed innocent. And notice that I stress and underline the word presume innocent until the one that accuses you, the prosecution, proves that you, the, or the accused, is guilty of the crime charged in the indictment. So you are, the accused is presumed, meaning, yes, you start off with a presumption, or the accused starts off with a presumption that they're innocent, however, that presumption can be overturned with evidence and it's the prosecution's burden to prove that he is not innocent, that the accused is guilty. So that's why the prosecution has the burden of proof. They have the burden of proof because of the presumption of innocence, meaning everybody is presumed innocent until proven guilty, and also because they are the ones that accuse. And if you accuse, you prove. You shouldn't be accusing people without evidence. That's a, a simplified way of explaining it. So, all right, so that's beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, what is beyond a reasonable doubt? What's that standard used for, huh? What is beyond a reasonable doubt used for, huh? It is used to convict a defendant of a crime charged by the prosecution. That standard is what is used to prove the guilt of a defendant. Now let me tell you something about beyond a reasonable doubt. In our criminal justice system, criminal justice system, we have what we call bifurcated trials. I'm going to write this down. Bifurcated trials. Bifurcated trial. In our criminal justice system. That means that the trial of the accused has two parts has two stages and you don't go to the stage number one until you finish and you are successful in stage number one. So therefore, the first stage in a criminal case, the first stage is what I call the guilt innocence stage. Guilt I'm just going to write it like this, innocence stage. In that first part of a criminal trial, the only 
the only issue, the only question is, did the defendant commit the crime, yes or no? Is there enough evidence to prove that the defendant committed the crime beyond a what? Reasonable doubt. Is there enough evidence to convict, to find him guilty or her of the crime that person is accused of? That is the only question. Therefore, only evidence that is relevant to that question is allowed. Only evidence that shows their guilt or innocence is allowed. Other evidence is not relevant and is taken out, suppressed not allowed for the jury not even to hear, much less to consider. <coughs> what type of evidence is not allowed in the guilt-innocence stage? For example, the criminal record of the accused. For the most part, there are exceptions. There's always exceptions. But for the most part, Evidence of his criminal record is not relevant and should not be allowed in the guilt innocent stage of the accused. Because you know what's going to happen? People are going to say, oh, look at him. He's a bad guy. He committed all these other offenses before, so he must be guilty of this. And so they're going to find him guilty because of his past because of his past mistakes. That's why the law says, no, 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 criminal records are not allowed. But like I said, there are exceptions. But we start off with that one. Another example of evidence that is not allowed, for the most part, generally, of course there are exceptions, is Evidence of uh, the defendant's uh, horrible life as a, you know, just like his criminal history is not allowed, his criminal record is not allowed. Also, evidence of sympathy for the defendant, like, you know, he suffered so much when he was little, he was abused, he was beaten, he was uh, raped, or whatever. All of that, or he was very poor, feel sorry for him, find him not guilty. Sympathy factors for the defendant or the victim, not allowed. Not allowed because the only issue in the guilt innocence stage of the case is did the defendant commit the crime, yes or no? Whether he's whether the defendant is poor, whether the defendant was abused, whether he was a bad guy, whether the victim was a good guy, whether the victim was a bad guy, with all of that is not relevant. There are exceptions, I'm not gonna get into that because that would be way too much into detail about that, but just so that you will know, you know, what the standards are. So, in the guilt innocence stage, that's one standard to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. This is where we use beyond a reasonable doubt to convict. To convict. Yeah, beyond a reasonable doubt is used to convict the defendant, to find the defendant guilty. So then, if, and I underline, if, if, underlined, if the jury or the judge finds the defendant guilty, then we go to the second stage of a criminal case. But only if they find him not guilty, it's over. The defendant walks away. Goodbye.
goodbye. He's free to go. He or she is free to go. But if they find the jury says they're guilty, the prosecution did prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt, or the judge says he's guilty, she's guilty, the prosecution did find, did prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Then we go to the second stage. The second stage is the punishment. Punishment. Or sentencing stage. Sentencing stage. At the sentencing stage, what evidence is used? Then, all types of evidence can be used. And it, in some jurisdictions, it doesn't have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a different standard, a lower standard, depending on the jurisdiction. So then other evidence can come in. Then the jury can consider the past behavior of a defendant. Then the jury can consider the how, how much suffering the defendant caused to his family, to the victim's family. All of those other things can come into play because now they are relevant because now we're going to see, well, how are we going to sentence the defendant? What kind of punishment should he receive? If it's a first offender, he shouldn't be punished the same way as a person that's committed this crime over and over and over again. A first offender may warrant be given a lighter sentence than a person that has already been to the Texas Department of Corrections or has already been to probation and is incorrigible. So, you know, uh, what about other mitigating circumstances that may warrant, you know, not giving the defendant such a harsh sentence or aggravating circumstances that may warrant giving him a higher or more severe sentence. So at the punishment stage or sentencing stage, then the prosecution can show the past criminal behavior of the defendant. Then the defendant can show uh, sympathy for himself and the prosecution can show sympathy for the victim and the victim's family and so forth, generally. Okay, but at the sentencing stage, there is no beyond a reasonable doubt. No. It's only at the guilt innocence. Okay, so now let's go to the next standard, which is called clear and convincing evidence. It's a lower standard than beyond a reasonable doubt. It's less evidence. I don't like to do this. It's not the law, all right? There is no such thing as what I'm gonna say. There's no legal law that says this, no legal authority. This is just a way for me to try to explain it to you to see if you can understand it in my own terms. So 100% is beyond all doubt. That law doesn't exist. There's no standard that says it, uh, that you know something has to be proven beyond all doubt because that would mean that the trier of fact would have to be a witness. So therefore, there's no such thing. But there is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the highest standard, and I would say in percentages that maybe that would be between 90% sure to 99% I'm sorry to 99% sure all right so between 90 and 99% sure that means beyond a reasonable doubt maybe like I like a, a disclaimer here there's no legal authority for this this is just 
my way of trying to explain it to you so that you could see the difference between the different standards of proof that we have in our legal system. Then we have clear and convincing evidence. Clear and convincing is a standard that is used in important cases such as CPS cases, Child Protective Services cases. When a child, there is some evidence that the child is at risk of or in danger or may be neglected and the state or the government interferes with the custody of that child and wants to say, hey, father or mother of this child, you're not a good father, you're not a good mother, we're going to take away the children from you, then the standard is less than beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's high. It's called clear and convincing evidence. And the reason why the courts invented that standard for CPS cases, for example, is because they figured that taking away a child is a very, very drastic, serious thing to do. And it shouldn't be taken lightly. So they didn't want to make it so hard as to put beyond a reasonable doubt because then what if the child is in danger and the state can't do anything because they can't prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. But at, they say, at the same time, they cannot make it that easy because it's a horrible thing to do also, to take away children from their parents and separate them from their parents is a horrible thing to do too. So they, it's sort of a compromise uh, to protect the child, but also to, to protect the child, to protect the child from abuse, but also to protect the child from being separated from his parents. So therefore, they invented clear and convincing evidence. And in some, it's not just used, that standard is not just used for CPS cases, but it, it's uh, mentioned a lot in CPS cases. It's also used in other types of cases, and I'm not going to get into that. But whenever you see clear and convincing evidence in anything that you see, you already know that it's a high standard, but not as high as beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's used... For example, in CPS cases to take away the children from their parents. So just uh, for to explain to you what that standard means, like I said, disclaimer, there's no legal authority for this. This is just my way of trying to explain it to you. So I would say that clear and convincing would be between 80% to maybe uh, 89 that's clear and convincing, more or less. Then we have a lower standard called preponderance of the evidence. If, I, if my hands are a scale, preponderance of the evidence, and let's say this is the defendant and this is the plaintiff. This standard is used only in civil cases, not criminal cases only civil. The one that has a little bit more evidence, 51%, is the one that wins. That's called preponderance of the evidence. And that's used in civil cases. And you know by my previous lectures the difference between a civil case and a criminal case. A civil case is where a crime has not been committed. The person is not, the person accused of the crime, of a uh, that is in the civil uh, defense side, is not facing prison. They're facing monetary damages or something that they have to do, but prison is not an option. They're not, uh, nobody is risking their life or liberty. Nothing like that is at stake. So that's in civil cases. If, if you can read it here, preponderance of the evidence is used in civil cases and it means 51%. Uh, 51% wins. Then you have a lower standard, and we're going to be talking a lot about this lower standard, and that is called 
Probable cause. Probable cause is something that we're going to talk about in the next uh, lecture that I'm going to give. But for now, look how it, low it is. That one is used to arrest the person, to justify an arrest, and to justify a search. So for search warrants and arrest warrants, the police have to show probable cause that a person committed a crime or probable cause that there will be evidence of that crime at a particular place. For search and seizure, probable cause is a standard. So look how low this standard is compared to beyond a reasonable doubt. This one's all the way down here. That's how easy it is to arrest a person or to search a person, but that's how high it is to convict that person. There is a difference. So probable cause, if I'm gonna go and explain it over here in percentages, and like I said, disclaimer, it's not a legal theory, I would say that probable cause is between 70% to maybe 79%, maybe. And then we have the lowest standard. We're gonna be talking about, shh, we're gonna be talking about this lowest standard called reasonable suspicion. And under reasonable suspicion, this is a standard that is used for uh, investigatory stops. Investigatory stops are temporary detentions that are based on reasonable suspicion. They're based on a famous, or you know, they're based on a famous on the law uh, from a famous case called Terry versus Ohio, and they justify a temporary brief detention and a um, superficial uh, search, frisk of a person's outer clothing for the protection of the police. And we will be studying that, those temporary detentions. But uh, to justify a temporary de detention and also a pat down or a frisk, of the person's outer clothing to see if there's a weapon in there for the protection of the police. To justify that, the police have to have reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion that the person is committing a crime right then and there or just committed a crime right before and the crime has to be super, has to be specific and then the police also have to have reasonable suspicion that that person may be armed, okay? And I'll get more into detail to that, but see how low this standard is compared to beyond a reasonable doubt? And over here, I would say, well, it's all the way between um, you know what? I apologize. When I say percentages, I forgot preponderance of the evidence. Preponderance of the evidence is 50%. Forgot about that. And then we would go to probable cause. And like I said, probable cause is between, I would say, 70% to 79%. And like I said, that's just, that's just a way of explaining this and maybe reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion, in my opinion, would be uh, 30%, more or less, 30% evidence that the person may be involved in a crime, where there's not enough evidence for probable cause, there's not enough evidence to arrest, there's not enough evidence to convict, much less, but there's a reasonable suspicion based on articulable facts, meaning that the uh, police has to be able to pronounce the facts. They cannot say it's a hunch or a feeling because a hunch or a feeling is meaningless. 
So it cannot be a hunch or a feeling. It has to be something that can be expressed in words that establish facts that give rise to reasonable suspicion that the person is about to commit a crime or has just committed a crime. Okay, so that's all for now. That's all I'm going to explain for now. Next lecture, I'm going to explain a little bit more about the difference between probable cause and reasonable suspicion, which are two very, very important standards that we are going to use in our next chapters, chapter six, seven, and eight of your textbook. It's gonna talk about those two. All right. There is a quiz on um, standards of proof. After this lecture, you can take the quiz. And uh, good luck. <laughs>